Welcome back to Politics in Hawaii with Dennis Esaki on Think Tech Hawaii. Today we'll be speaking with Richard Ha from the Big Island of Hawaii. Richard Ha is a Keikioka Aina. Well, he's not in politics per se, but I first met him while we were both helping uh, Governor Neil Abercrombie. He is a native Hawaiian, a Vietnam veteran, officer. Thank you, Richard, for your service. A farmer and is involved with alternative energy and uh, among other things. Like me, he grew up on a farm. Richard, thank you for joining us. You have been on many shows, but do tell us a little bit about yourself, your philosophy, about your not knock in philosophy, and uh, studying with agriculture. Richard? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, the, the, I was largely influenced by, uh, well, I should say, I, my family is Kamahili from uh, Lower Puna. And we had family land on the ocean, and they were self-sufficient, yeah, mm -hmm. between the ocean and what they grew. So I was heavily influenced by how they, their, uh, their philosophy and how they treated uh, the land and each other. So um, that's the main thing. But also, when I was about 10 years old, my pop uh, told me a lot of stories. And that particular time in life, I was, I, I was real receptive to, to listening to these kinds of stories. And his, his philosophy basically was not no can, can, yeah? So we'd be sitting at our dinner table, which is basically a picnic table, yeah, with six kids. And uh, he would tell stories that's uh, impossible to do. And he'd pound the table that the dishes would fly in the air and he would say, not no can, can. And then he would say, there's a thousand reasons why no can. I am only looking for the one reason why I can. And then he would say, Find two solutions for every problem and one more just in case. <laughs> you know, so yeah, that kind of philosophy. Yeah. And I was at the age where I was, you know, fourth, fourth grade, 10 years old. I, I absorbed all these things and, and I didn't know how important it was to who I became until I, I, you know, I got to be about 40. And then now I'm 77. Uh, I became my parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But it was really good um, grounding, and that's why I'm so concerned about young young kids, elementary school kids, because they're the, at the point where they're very receptive to to listen to uh, um, um, interesting things, new things, imagination, and stuff like that. Because as soon as you get to high school, already you you more smart than your parents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um. But you started uh, farming, you had big farms. Uh, I grew up on a farm also. We had papayas, tomatoes, potatoes, bananas. When I went to the experiment station, my dad told me to get some keiki. So they were going to give me six. Oh, they had one pile over there, but they gave me six. They told me cut them up, so we planted. He expanded to over 10 acres. And uh, I wanted to get out of farming. so. Uh, when they do surveying, but uh, you had the uh, big crops, but then you got out of it. Uh, why did you get out of farming? Well, I've been out of farming maybe three, four years, something like that. Um, well, actually it's more, more like seven or eight years because what, what happened was um, the cost was going up so high that we couldn't compete um, because what we needed to do was we needed to uh, replace the infrastructure we had, and then we'd have to go back and invest. And it didn't make any sense, you know, the, uh, uh, the numbers wouldn't work out because the plus has always got to exceed the minuses or, or you're not sustainable. So it didn't work out, but it was at the time when the uh, economy was good and our workers could find other jobs. So, you know, when I looked at everything, I told myself, you know what? We better leave now while, while they have an option. And so that, that's what we decided to do. But right at about that time, um, I was approached by these folks that wanted to do a medical cannabis operation. And they asked me if you know, I'd be interested in participating. And I said that I would, 
under three conditions. You know, one was that the first one was my, my, my workers would have the first shot at the jobs. The second one was uh, the neighborhood, the people would be as secure or more secure than before. And then the third one was, I would have to have a real job, not just be a, a cartoon caricature on a stick. So they said, yeah, okay. And, I, and so I went back to my workers and I said, hey, you know what? These folks don't, came to me with a proposition. And I, you know, so I'm asking you folks, how many of you folks would be interested in a job working for a marijuana company? Everybody raised their hands. You know, it was kind of, um, they were very receptive to that. So, you know, and then I uh, uh, started working with them. And, and the reason they asked me to join was because I have background in um, indoor agriculture, control the environment agriculture. So I understood what it, how, how to do that. And uh, so I stayed there for three years. Uh, I, I committed for four years, but by the third year, I could see that they were well on the way and they, they were pretty well positioned. So I resigned, uh, retired basically, so I could do the things I like to do now, which is what I'm doing now. Yeah, I saw that you resigned from Low Ola. You know? Yeah, that's the so, so yeah, that, uh, what is that? Uh, leaf of life or what it means. Uh, yeah. But yeah, yeah then, then they changed the name to Big Island Grown Dispensaries, you know. Yeah, defined, but I don't. To me, it kind of lose the <laughs> the way in definition. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, switching. Uh, sw switching gears uh, up on Mauna Kea. It you know it has to do with balance of science, taking care of the land and spirit of the land and the people. The politicians didn't know what to do with TMT, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's 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 a tough situation all the way around. But it's it's. Uh, I think we need to take a step back and, and try to see what will life look like for future generations. And then you know, there's an opportunity to rebrand uh, Hawaii tourism from uh, sun and surf to science and, and quality. Because if we're talking about the 30 meter telescope, or if we're talking, if, if not even the 30 meter telescope, the fact that there is an astronomy out there at the best location in the world, um, that, that's a, a place that we can see. The thing about uh, uh, astronomy is the resource is the stars and what you can see deep into space. And you don't actually uh, affect the land or the roads or, or, or the infrastructure on the ground. That, that uh, resource is basically free. So if we can ask ourselves, where do we want our kids to be one generation from now, let alone, uh, I mean, seven generations from now, let alone just one, you know, it's, uh, when you look at it that way, it takes, it takes uh, a different perspective compared to just today and fighting with each other about, you know, whatever it is that's in the problem. If we look down the road, one generation, um, a simple way of looking at it is this way, is to say, um, what happens 25 years from now? A kid born today, 25 years from now is one generation. That's 2046. Um, that's one year after we're supposed to be 100% renewable. Now that's the same life of a solar plant or, or you know, a wind farm, some stuff like that. So at the end, when the one generation from now, it needs to be replaced. Um, will the cost of the infrastructure be cheaper or not? It's probably going to be more expensive because there's all these uh, uh, metals and compounds and stuff that you got to dig out of the ground in foreign country and, and put it, bring it all the way here. Um, so it's not going to be cheaper. And that's why we, we're talking about geothermal. Because geothermal, uh, we're over the hotspot, and we're going to be over the hotspot for a million to two million years. And the heat and the steam is free. It just comes out of the ground. If you have a pipe, 
It just comes out of the ground, spins a turbine, making electricity. So, whereas now, uh, we're, we're mostly trying to make uh, uh, electricity out of natural gas, and we're trying to avoid you know, the stuff that puts carbon in the air. Um, and a geothermal doesn't uh, give off any carbon, and it doesn't give off any noxes. So, and we don't have to go chase after it, it just comes out of the ground. So it's sitting here, we have it, we just all need to get together and talk about what we want for future generations. And that, that's kind of what, that's one aspect of, you know, what we're about. Yeah, I remember, I think it was in the 80s, I don't know if you were involved there, they started to talk about the geothermal energy, because a lot of guys were against it. At that time, they say, oh, well, you know, they associate that with the sulfur smell. And uh, it, there was a big fight uh, that I guess you come a long way. You had to, there was a plant. I don't know if it was uh, the one you're involved with, but the volcano, lava flow damaged it, wasn't it? Yeah. Recently. Has, is that back up and running? Well, it's coming back online. And, and we are not advocating for any more development there in the lava zone because of the rifts primarily. But there's also cult cultural issues associated with lava, fresh lava, and uh, Pele, and, 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 and those kinds of uh, things. So what we're advocating for is for something like, uh, why don't we do some um, exploration, evaluation of the uh, geothermal resource on the the five volcanoes that we have on the Big Island, away from the East Rift. So we're not talking about the East Rift anymore. We're looking at other locations. And, and, and it has to be cultural appropriate and safe and all these different things, yeah? But we haven't done anything yet. So we really need to do something. Yeah, but some of the other volcanoes are really old, old compared to uh, where you're at, right? Yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, but, you know, we, we went on a tour to the Philippines with uh, Mayor Billy Kanoi. And when we went to look at the uh, geothermal operation, it was sitting on a volcano that last erupted 100,000 years ago. So the first thing that came to my mind is, hey, Chubby, I, I wonder how long ago all volcanoes erupted. So when I came back, I, I asked, and the geologist said that the last time Mauna Kea erupted was 4,000 years ago. So it didn't take a but, genius. To figure yeah, out. I mean, yeah, that's new, you know. It's new yeah. com in geologic time. You know, yes. like I guess on Kauai, we had like 5 million years or something. The other islands get, you know, 3 million years. So that uh, kind of rules us out, but it's good for your um, your island, yeah. of, uh, Hawaii island. But you're talking about, you know, spiritual and all that. A while ago, I went to test out the helicopter to purchase. So we flew over the volcano. And as we flew over it, uh, the guys were taking pictures. A camera just exploded and the film came rolling out. It's a bigger mm -hmm. issue. There must be some energy over here, you know, more, <laughs> more ease than one. So it made a believer out of me. <laughs> so, um, so uh, where are you going with this uh, geothermal energy right now? Where is it? Well, we need, we need funding to do exploration because until you actually do the exploration, and we're talking about surface exploration, you can send uh, radio waves down and uh, uh, evaluate what, what is under there. And uh, so we're looking at other places, yeah? Like on Kohala Mountains, we can look all around there. And then once you kind of decide where is an appropriate place to do the exploration, and, and you do it, then you can, um, whenever the electric utility wants to add more capacity, we already have the data so that when people come to bid, they, they'll bid with information uh, because the upfront cost is really the, the, the most risk, yeah? To drill someplace that has no uh, geothermal uh, expert, I mean, uh, potential, cost big money, like in the millions, yeah? Yeah, that um, the Kohala side is a little bit older volcano also, right? 
and it, yeah, I, it, I, it I, is the yeah, oldest yeah. volcano. And then the second oldest is Kuala Lai. Kuala, yeah, right. The third is Mauna Kea. The fourth is Mauna Loa. Oh, what the? Well, Mauna Kea is third. Uh, um, yeah, it's uh, a while back in the seventies. I worked on that OPEC ocean thermal energy conversion. Mm. Uh, so they're using that, I know, for to for some other sea life they're growing there. But how is that being used for energy, if anything? Well, that's what they first were looking at to see if they could use the the different in in, in temperature. To, to generate electricity, but you know, it never panned out economically. So, but they had to become uh, uh, self-sufficient. So they started to do a lot of other things, yeah? Like bottled water. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's they, a big thing right now, huh? Yeah, big, really. Big yeah. money, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and the stuff, you know, like algae, for example. Yeah. They, they do that, and um, clams, and uh, uh, oysters, stuff like that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you know, uh, I know the energy. Uh, they did a project on Kauai. You, you know, I think it was funded by the military. You were going to use algae for, for fuel. The, the, the military spent a lot of money here. Um, yeah, it's you know, like, like you said, it's like on tap potential over there with the geothermal. Um, so you don't see them drilling anywhere close to where, uh, I mean, you don't have to be in a lava flow, but uh, in the more uh, apparent areas, you looking at farther away. Yeah, you know, around the base of Mauna Kea, um, they actually were dr drilling for water. For the military, and they they started uh, noticing that the heat of the water started rising, and so they were the the amount it was rising. They they could tell that if they, they drilled another thousand feet, they would be equivalent to what uh, Puna Geothermal had. Mm. So that, that was something like six thousand feet or something. So, and they they had no idea that there was that much heat on the that particular place. So that was actually driven and taking core samples and analyzing the different uh, uh, complexities of the uh, lava. Uh, and um, then they did surface exploration around the base. Uh, so what I was talking about was on the west side of Mauna Kea. So then they came around the side and they, they did around the east side of Mauna Kea, going toward Waimea. And, and they picked up uh, heat under, under there. So, but they haven't done enough uh, exploration. They really need to do a lot more. So how is it in conjunction with Halco? Uh, these, this wasn't in uh, uh, a Halco project. This was with the uh, Hawaii Groundwater and Geothermal Resource Center, which is at uh, UH Manoa. And uh, it, it was a, it, it's a new, uh, relatively new um, part of the university. And it does uh, groundwater and geothermal assessment, yeah, uh, anal analysis, yeah. And stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that, that, that is a place where they can actually do the drilling. They have equipment and they, they, they have the experience. They just don't have enough funding. A while ago, we met with local leaders, including yourself, about setting up a co-op like on Koi, uh, mm. yeah. you know, purchase a local electric company. But you need a willing seller. You know, it was successful on Kauai. Um, I think you had set up something. Of course, you need the funding to do the drilling, though. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, so we you, did. You know, and, and this is a result of, you, you remember we asked, if you could come and give, give a talk. Yeah. So, yeah, so you guys came from KIUC. Yeah. And, Kauai, yeah. and right after that, we formed the co-op. Yeah. And the co-op is still in existence. Yeah. And, and you're right. You know, you need to have a willing seller. Yeah? So, but what we thought was, 
we need to get prepared ahead of time in case there is a willing seller. You know, we didn't see that there was a <clears throat> seller. But the reason that happened was because you remember when Next Era came, what, looking to buy the utility. So that's when we decided that we better uh, look into this. So you folks came, came and gave the presentation. And right after that, we formed the uh, uh, Hawaii Island Energy Corps. It's still in existence. Yeah. It still has money. Yeah. It's just waiting for a willing seller. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we, have know. The, we have the, the financing uh, committed, you know, but at a certain level, yeah. So, yeah. 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 I used to belong to a national association of electric co-ops as a director in Arlington. There are a lot of co electric co-ops, you know, a lot of them are distribution only, so you don't have to be, you know, everything like what we do at Kauai. Some of them, you know, get, you know, the power plant, some is only distribution, they buy the power and then they distribute that. Um, so we have, you know, potential for something and uh, hope you're successful in the geothermal. But uh, I don't know, talking about the military, it's kind of uh, risky talking about military doing drilling and water and everything right now. When they think about Red Hill. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, it's, uh, but, uh, well, good luck with that. And, well, I want to say one more thing. You know, the, the, the lands that we were talking about on the, uh, uh, on the side, the slopes of Mauna Kea, right. uh, it's Hawaiian Homes land. So it's a different deal here, Hawaiian Homes land. So it's not the military so much. Um, and we're, we're working with the folks there, the Hawaiian Homes Associations, because um, we're not the leaders there, but we're, we're talking to them, giving them advice as what they can do, uh, what the issues are involved, right. and possibly what they could do is identify a place where it looks like there's a, a geothermal and, and lease the land. You know, like uh, outside people come in, lease the land, and then they uh, pay the Hawaiian Homes so much. Well, why couldn't the uh, uh, beneficiaries do that? Is what we're telling them. Yeah. So, I think there's a big potential there. Yeah, it's um, and on the whole, uh, Hawaiian homelands, uh, mm. the electric co-op made a deal with them, put a large solar farm there. You know, they get paid, and I believe after 25 years, probably about 20 years now, it the thing goes to the HHL or their their association. So I think it's a win-win and all that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So so right now you're, you know, you go into all kind of ventures, you doing something with a uh, cultural center or? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, what, you know, everything we're talking about, it's very important that we have a cultural component to this. You know, because you know, take, take uh, um, the 30 meter telescope, for example. They just had what they call a 10 year, you know, it's a decadal survey. And that survey came out with Mauna Kea, uh, the 30 meter telescope, I'm sorry, combined with uh, uh, the Greek Magellan telescope in Chile. Um, they applied. Uh, and, and the National Science Foundation uh, agreed that this, this, this looked like, you know, uh, the, the, the number one uh, project that they would be looking at. And, but if, if it is, then it would come with uh, conditions. And one of the main conditions in which we're really happy about is, is that they, they require um, that they be uh, real uh, close attention to the indigenous people's point of view. And that's what we've been advocating from day one, yeah? that we gotta make sure we take into account the cultural uh, uh, points of view. And myself, you know, I, I'm going into the third halau uh, um, ohia, which is a, a you know it's teaching about cultural values, the the the, the old uh, ancient Hawaiian point of view, and the ancient Hawaiian point of view makes a lot of sense. To me, you know, once I got into it, because I, I wasn't uh, 
really knowledgeable about, about it because I spent 10 years going to the mainland to speak our conferences and I've been to five of them. And so I knew from the Western point of view, the numbers and all that kind of stuff to do with peak oil. But I had no idea that how the Hawaiians were set up. And, and the way they're set up is that a long time ago, you know, if you look at the Hawaiian uh, uh, economic system back in the old days, and keeping in mind that they, they didn't have metals and they didn't even have uh, bicycles or printing press. Um, their, their economic system was a physical science um, ecology uh, economic system. Then they had a um, cultural um, system that was set up with, with, with the guardrails. And how they did it was what they did was consider all living things reverence of humans. So in other words, they really were concerned about all, all everything that grew. They, 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 uh, it wasn't a resource to be just utilized and thrown away because today we're operating in a world of uh, exponential growth on a finite planet. That is clearly not sustainable. The way the Hawaiians had it, it was sustainable. It was sustainable for a thousand years and so they knew how to do it and they're teaching the classes I'm going to is teaching the same values so the more I look into it the more I realize that uh, the, the Hollings actually knew what they were doing and maybe we should learn something from them. Yeah. So is that uh, tied in with sustainable energy Hawaii? Yeah yeah absolutely you know so we're looking at we're, we're going to have a uh, um, uh, um, a seminar in February 5th. And, and that seminar is gonna be focused on geothermal. The Sustainable Energy Hawaii is about geothermal. It's also about Mauna Kea, using Mauna Kea uh, as a resource uh, for future generations and taking into consideration and respect for Hawaiian culture. So those two things are very important, but the cultures uh, uh, and science center above the clouds, that that is set up to combine uh, culture with astronomy. So, and, and from there, you know, the, the poor Kanahele folks, you know, with the Iri uh, Kanaka uh, Foundation, they, they, they have a, um, um, like Pua was giving a, a class. And when I looked at her class, she said, you don't, I don't grant for you, you don't grant for me. And essentially what it was saying is that I'm okay, I, I, I can say what I need to say, you don't have to believe it. You can say what you have to say, I don't have to believe it. And, and the reason that is, is because depending on your age, yeah, you, you, you receive different information differently. See, so like, I, I don't know if I mentioned earlier on, but at the start, you know, when you're like in, in the fourth grade, you're very receptive. By the time you come to high school, you must want in your parents. And you don't want to listen anymore. And then you, as a kupuna, like me, I'm a kupuna now. I look back and I see the folks, you know, at that age, I laugh because I was like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? So, but yeah. that's how they looked at things, which is quite smart. You know, the kupuna has the experience. Yeah. Uh, well, Richard, uh, we're running out of time. Thank you, Richard. Huh? Oh, yeah. Thank Thanks you. for joining us today and sharing your insights. And good luck on your future endeavors. You have been watching Politics in Hawaii with Dennis Isaki and Richard Ha on Think Tech Hawaii, a 501c3 nonprofit. If you like the show, please tell your friends and help support Think Tech Hawaii and the wonderful staff and volunteers. Mahalo, aloha, ahoi ho, and malama pono.